Well, welcome, Tom, to Microsoft Research. And uh, it's great having you here as part of um, giving your uh, distinguished lecture tomorrow at Microsoft Research AI. Um, just getting going about some of your background and interests, I'm just curious how you got interested in machine learning to begin with. You started out in Oberlin, and were you always interested in mechanism and machines, or how did you get going into AI? Well, um, I guess I was always interested in kind of engineering things. My, I had an uncle who was an MIT PhD who worked in numerical controlled milling machines. And, uh, and then he was one of the early people, he's working for General Electric on the Dartmouth time sharing system. So, so as a young kid, I got a chance to, to write in basic on a teletype dialed into Dartmouth from Maryland, which is where he was. Now, how did he end up giving you time on this machine? Over, it was over, just in over, his living over, room. Over a dinner living room. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but, but then, and so I was always doing computing, and, and you know, in those days when you applied to college, you said, well, what computer do they have? Because they would have only one, right? Um, and so Oberlin had an IBM 360 Model 44, as well as a Ristus 11, PDP-8, I think. Uh, I mean, it was PDP-11. Um, so uh, I really wasn't, I, you know, I was, I, I considered many majors along the way. I was always taking a lot of math because that was fun. Um, but one of the ones I considered was political science. And one of the classes in political science was the philosophy of political science. And my uh, professor instructed me to read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions because he said, you know, Karl Marx claimed that he was a scientist. Marx did. And, and here's what Thomas Kuhn thinks science is. What do you think? Uh, which was very provocative because in some sense, uh, some people might accuse Kuhn of being a quasi-Marxist. Right, uh, and that he, he had all these interesting ideas about big scientific paradigm paradigm shifts. shifts, and but the incommensurability of vocabulary and some of the sort of subjectivism that maybe Marx also advocated. Right, that, so I'm getting lost now. How but, did this get going case, towards AI? <laughs> in any case, then when I uh, I decided to go to to at least get a master's in computer science, and I went to to, to Illinois, and I was offered a research assistantship by uh, Richard Michalski. Uh, and, uh, and it was about what we now call machine learning. Um, but in my spare time, I was hanging out in the philosophy library reading about the philosophy of science because I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing this machine learning stuff, I should be trying to understand how is it that we learn about the world and, and what are the sort of foundational principles. And so that led me into a lot of these kind of uh, questions about inductive logic. Confirmation and theory and Carnap. Confir Carnap, yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then sort of, uh, I don't know, you know, through a connection with Donald Mickey, I, I uh, was introduced to Bruce Buchanan, who lo and behold was a philosopher of science. And so then he offered me, uh, you know, a, a research position as a graduate student at Stanford. And uh, so these things kind of snowballed. But while I was still a master's student at Illinois, uh, you know, Tom Mitchell and, and Jaime Harbinell and, and Richard organized the first machine learning workshop, which was at CMU in the summer of 1980. And all 20 of us or whatever were in the room. Uh, and so that was the, that's, they decided to, to revive the term that Arthur Samuel had chosen of machine learning as being the name of the field. Yeah, I didn't realize that, that yeah. Arthur Samuel chose that, that phrase. Yeah, I think one of the titles in one of his first papers is uh, Some Studies of Machine Learning on the Game of Checkers or something like that. Very interesting. So. Yeah, some of the early work in machine learning that I've read over the years um, uh, really seems to have laid out the whole architecture of modern machine learning quite early, like in the early 60s, in fact. Some great work was done. Well, especially if, yeah, if you go to, say, um, uh, you know, Nils Nielsen had this book, Learning Machines, 1967, maybe? Uh, and, uh, and then and Duda and Hart, I think, particularly. Uh, what a beautiful book they wrote, yeah. Now you mentioned that, uh, somewhere I saw you mention that you're you have research attention disorder. Uh, deficit uh, disorder, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> attention, deficit, attention deficit disorder. Yeah. I guess like, it's like, I, I, I think people that are the most fun in the field um, seem to be intellectually promiscuous. In other words, not that they dance around with attention deficit disorder, but they go deep in several different areas over time and they make links among those areas. And I always think that's kind of an interesting thing to, as a way to do science. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and so yes, I mean, I think you also maybe suffer from this, <laughs> suffer but uh, but or yes, enjoy but, uh, but or enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I find uh, basically all of these sort of every aspect of artificial intelligence fascinating. 
Um, and I've also always wanted to have uh, one foot in some sort of an application setting because, uh, of course, we came of age kind of maybe in reaction to the, to the artificial intelligence of 1965 to 1975, which was all about the blocks world and kind of toy problems. And it was pretty clear that things that worked on those problems didn't really work on anything else. Uh, you know, and I like to think of the history of, of, uh, of artificial intelligence as the period of the known knowns when it was fully deterministic, fully observed systems. And then we had the known unknowns period of, uh, you know, Eudea Pearl and probabilistic reasoning over fully observable things, more or less. And then we've moved now into the unknown unknowns of how do we give systems that really work in open worlds where the computer does not have a full model of, of what's going on. In fact, I think you, you've uh, pointed out that um, having a full model in a world with, with by definition, limited data sets uh, is actually uh, desired for the fundamental you know, theorem of machine learning. Right, well, because, yes, in, in machine learning, we have, we have learned uh, that, right, that we, if we don't have enough data, then we have to use uh, deliberately oversimplify our models. We want um, to do that. Yes, in order to get the, the best, uh, say, performance classification accuracy or, or predictive accuracy. And this is something that's deeply disturbing. Uh, <laughs> if you've been raised kind of in the realist philosophy of science, which says, well, there is a real reality out there. Uh, the electrons really exist, for instance, even though we can't observe them. And, uh, and our goal is to understand that. But if you come from the instrumentalist community, which is where Bruce Buchanan uh, brought me up to, to be. Uh, we're really interested in uh, science is, is, is important as it is useful to solving the problems we really care about. Now, uh, now so. I, you and I know we, we, we've uh, had deeply shared interests in AI in the open world and the, the implications of uh, limitations in the technology uh, in terms of influences on AI people and society more broadly. And right. you've done some really fascinating uh, review work and some deep dives into what it will take to build robust AI, what, what we're up against in, in trying to achieve robustness in our AI systems as we field them in the open world. And you've had a few ideas, like like the idea of open category learning, for example. And I mm -hmm. just wanted to make some comments on where you are with that. Well, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this began with an application problem, right? I was working with uh, ecologists and people at the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and they uh, want to assess the health of freshwater streams in the United States. And one way they do that is to uh, sample the bugs that live in those streams. So it turns out, um, you know, if you have a, an insect larvae that may live for a month in a stream, uh, it's, it's uh, so in some sense drinking the water the whole time. And so if it's alive, and healthy, then that's a pretty good sign that the stream is healthy. Um, so uh, we had collected specimens, well, our collaborators had collected 100 specimens each of 54 different species of these kind of indicator insects. And we built a computer vision system that could automatically recognize them. And we were very excited that it was like 92% correct on 54 classes. Um, until we found out that, well, if we were dealing with real field samples, they would contain a lot of other stuff besides our 54 species because there are something like 2,000 species of insects that live in these rivers, not to mention uh, insect-shaped leaves and, uh, uh, and little stones and things that might fool the computer vision system. And, uh, and our system failed miserably when it was shown these, these uh, we call them aliens now, but these new, at least new to the computer, uh, species of insects. So that really motivated me to think about this open category uh, work. And, uh, and me and many other people, this is a hot topic in computer vision. Well, let's describe to people watching okay. this video what, what open, open Category Challenge is. So the Open Category Challenge is that I've taught my computer to tell the difference among these 54 species, but then someone at test time shows me a, a, a thing and says, what is it? And the standard way that we train a machine learning system, it really only knows, that it thinks that there are only 40, 54 types of things in the universe. So if you stick your thumb into the camera and it'll photograph it, it would assign it to one of those 54 categories. Now it might say, well, I can't decide whether it's this or that, but it never enters its mind, so to speak, that there might be something else out there. And so the question is, how could we have a computer system that knows that it doesn't know everything. So it knows that it, that it knows these 54 things, but there are potentially thousands of other things out there. And uh, so it, it, it entertains that explicitly as a possibility. 
And so our strategy has been to say, um, uh, for the computer, so when we train the computer system, the standard way is to ask it, kind of like when training a physician, what, is, what are the key differences that would let you tell that this is, this is versus that? I mean, if you've ever uh, tried to recognize bird species, you know you're supposed to look for like a red dot above the eye. Or if you're learning to tell poisonous mushrooms from, from, uh, from delicious mushrooms, you maybe want to look for gills or something. Uh, and the same thing is true for these insects. But the, the, the end result is that the computer it has learned to make these fine distinctions, but it doesn't really know what the whole insect looks like. It's just looking for that red dot and not for everything else. So we instead want to uh, have the computer learn models of uh, that sort of just give it a sense of what each of these species really looks like so that when it sees my thumb, it says, well, that doesn't look like anything that I saw in my training data. So I, I refuse to assign it to one of my 54 categories. I'm going to hand it to Eric here, who's an expert, and he'll tell me what it is. Yeah, it's interesting to think about all the things we can do to give our systems either explicit or implicit knowledge that the world is bigger than they are, much, much right. bigger. <laughs> and so they're ready to deal with, with, with uh, being humble about what they know and what they don't yeah. know. Um, I think you've also looked at um, this idea of how to do um, um, reinforcement learning in a safe way or you th think deeply about missing exogenous variables, for example. Right. So, um, yeah, the, that came up more in um, not so much that the exogenous variables are missing, but that they are present. So if you imagine... And, uh, and that your knowledge right. is missing of them, yeah. of course, because they're exogenous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, this isn't really my own work, but I have looked at, uh, as you say, I've been surveying the literature, and there's some very nice work by Shai Manor and his students where they... Uh, uh, one, one intuition I think we all have is that um, in situations where we know that we're ignorant, we should probably act more conservatively and carefully. Be, uh, and it turns out we can make this precise mathematically and show that if, uh, if, we, uh, if we minimize downside risk, so the, in a, uh, when we're training reinforcement learning systems, we typically look at like the expected reward or the expected return. And you might be looking at that if you're investing in stocks on Wall Street, too. You might say, well, uh, I, I want to choose a mutual fund that has a high expected return. And that's what they advertise, in fact. But maybe really, uh, particularly as you get older, you might be concerned about downside risk. And so you might say, well, I want to invest in a mutual fund that maybe it doesn't get the highest overall risk, but the probability that I'll lose more than 50% of my funds, they, they like drive that near zero. And so um, we, it turns out that we can show that that kind of a notion that I want to limit my downside risk is equivalent to, um, to uh, dealing with average, maximize my average return when I'm uncertain of the dynamics of the world. And so, so this does confirm in, in a mathematical way that, that it's good to be conservative when you, when you don't know uh, how the world works. So, so um You've recently been weighing in on this discussion, which has has been evolving, of mm -hmm. uh, just maybe the last uh, year or two. But it goes back a long ways about innate knowledge, innate structure, innate algorithms that mm -hmm. uh, intelligent systems might have, harkening back to human beings and going from toddlers into adulthood. Um, what's the innate? innate abilities that we have and what do we, what, what do we learn on top of that and, 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 uh, um, and there are various approaches to, to this and I, and I think you've been talking about your own perspective lately or at least, at least raising questions about this in terms of, of this idea of the minim, a minimal system that we might build someday and that would do lifelong learning and become brilliant in the world and, and be able to do well. Thoughts on your current thoughts on this uh, this discussion? Well, um, yeah. So, so uh, there's certainly a, a, a significant portion of the AI research community, and also I think the general public, when they think about artificial intelligence, they think about something that would be like an artificial human being, or something that would have the the same breadth of knowledge as people do. Uh, whereas our current AI systems are always extremely narrow. It's hard to you cannot overemphasize how narrow our systems are. I call these things uh, uh, sort yeah. of brilliant savants. Right. I don't throw the word idiot out too often, but just no. narrow savants. They're very, very narrow. And so, um, uh, 
and, and, and that's a system we seem to know how to, to build right now. And so, um, uh, um, I don't know, how does this connect to innateness? I guess uh, we observe in people that, that they do come into the world with some degree of, of innate knowledge. Uh, we, we, we can't interview them to find out what it is. But, uh, but they can do these studies on infants, of course. Well, certainly, uh, certainly toddlers seem to have way more breadth. Well, yeah, certainly, yes, yes. Near and none birth. of our AI systems can, can <laughs> come close to a three-year-old in terms of either their well, ability to... even like a few months old. Yeah, well, that could be, yeah. So, I mean, it's not really my area of expertise, but certainly uh, uh, there are these studies and also studies in other animal species. So we know that many animals are, well, uh, are, are born almost like adu adults. Obviously, a, a horse can already stand and walk, immediately after birth, uh, whereas humans uh, need, need an adult human to hang on for a year and before they really are even start to be able to walk. So, um, so one lesson you might take from that is uh, one of the things that's allowed humans to be more broad is that we are born with less built-in pre-wired uh, knowledge. And, uh, and if we want AI systems, so, so this is kind of the paradox is that in order to get our narrow systems, uh, even our narrow systems to work, we build in a ton of prior knowledge into them. So uh, there's a huge amount of innate knowledge, although it's often not explicit. I mean, uh, you know, innate knowledge is not like that they've memorized the times tables. It's more that there's some set of constraints so that when those constraints combine with the experiences that the system has, then it's able to rapidly do well in that narrow area. Um, and uh, one big uh, thing we would like to do is have our AI systems be broader. Uh, a lot of the mistakes that our AI systems make right now are because they are so narrow that, uh, that they might, I mean, we saw this case recently uh, of the, um, you know, I think it was BMW that, that, that was, uh, uh, that had this uh, self-driving car system, right, that they had trained and then they took it to Australia and it was being fooled by the motions of kangaroos because it had never really seen kangaroos hopping around before. And, uh, and so th that was an example of it was just too narrow in one particular way and it couldn't deal with this, this broader thing. But also I think when we look at a lot of these ethical challenges of, uh, of, of AI systems where we're uh, making misclassification errors that, uh, that are really offensive to some people. The computer is completely uh, uh, oblivious to the fact that some people might be insulted by, by uh, being misclassified. Uh, uh, and, uh, or it could be very insensitive, for instance, to be positioning advertisements for funeral homes opposite uh, com um, you know, news stories about car crashes or something. Uh, why, why would our customers be upset with that? It's because the computer system knows nothing about life or death well, why would or even, funerals why would or they anything. chuckle about that? Right, yes, right. or yes, <laughs> right, yeah. So, it's, um, so we would definitely like our computer systems to be much broader. And, uh, but to do that, we need to be building in less or, or building in different kind of, of innate knowledge into them. Because we know that uh, if you try to learn starting with nothing, then it will basically take you an infinite amount of data to learn things. And, uh, so there's a very tight trade-off there between the amount of experience we need and the, the amount of knowledge we have to build into the system. You've, you've been through many different, uh, we'll call them um, dominant paradigms, back to Kuhn, mm. uh, <laughs> of machine learning, um, going from certainty factors and heuristic methods um, it, through probabilistic graphical models, and now we're in this era of, of deep learning. Um, these general, generalized function learning with differentiation and optimization. What's your sense with where things are going, especially in terms of the, the rich semantics and the semantic foundations of learning systems? Uh, yeah, it has been quite a ride. Um, <laughs> and I think also there's been a, uh, the, the pendulum swings back and forth between whether we start with a formal understanding and then the experiments follow, or we start with the experiments and then the formal understanding follows. And we're definitely in a period right now where there's this sort of crazy experimentation. Uh, many, many people have, got, have been very excited by the Some deep Some people learning. have even called it alchemy. Well, yes, or I call it a giant hackathon. <laughs> it's like the whole field right. um, aided and abetted by the internet and archiving and, and people just posting papers and, and software frameworks. And it's been an incredibly productive time, I think. Uh, uh, it, it particularly surprising because we have all of these 
large corporate interest in this and many companies, and yet... And competitive we terrain. In very competitive <laughs> terrain, and yet there's a tremendous sharing of yep. the core tools, and, and everybody's learning from everybody else very quickly. So, um, uh, so uh, I mean, I, I, I think right now deep learning is getting a lot of attention, but in parallel, uh, and, and, wh and why? Well, because it's given us uh, an even more expressive uh, set of functions or class of models, uh, uh, a, a language that lets us uh, be able to use machine learning to do things we couldn't do before. Uh, and so that's, and we, and that really required, you know, yes, uh, coming up with the language, which we kind of had from neural networks in the 90s, but improved algorithms much improved computation and vastly improved data and all of those things really coming together. But those same factors are at work on the probabilistic modeling side. So, you know, you sort of left off with, with uh, latent variable models, but then we had Bayesian nonparametrics and then we've, now we have probabilistic programming. And interestingly, we now have probabilistic programming systems that are compiling to the same TensorFlow infrastructure that the deep learning systems are compiling to. And we're, and we're seeing lots of really interesting uh, interplay between probabilistic reasoning, for instance, about, uh, say, um, uh, the variational autoencoders and, and high, high dimensional density estimation. I think there's some extremely exciting ideas happening at, at the there. Synthesis of these. So this is really, yes, using neural network type machinery, but to do probabilistic modeling. Because I think ultimately, uh, we need to be able, in order to understand and debug and, 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 uh, and ensure the safety of these AI systems, make sure they're actually doing what we want them to, we need to be able to understand the, the, what they've learned and the, the intermediate semantics. And I think the only tool we have for that is, it comes out of probability, uh, at, which gives us a declarative reading of what these variables mean, and it gives us uh, you know, the theory of, of identifiability of the parameters and all of these things that that we don't get from the pure function learning uh, approach. On the other hand, the big lesson I think that we have to take away from the function learning was that in, in computer vision at least, right, we tried, we know that to go from pixels all the way to saying, oh, that is a person sucking on a lollipop or whatever, that is such a huge leap in, in interpretation uh, that, uh, that, that we needed to have some intermediate representations along the way. And we tried to hand engineer those, and we had SIFT, our, our fellow graduate student David Lowe had invented this, and Paul Viola, and, and, uh, and Hogg, and so on. And it turned out these deep learning things could just learn those representations directly instead, much better than we could do them by hand. So, uh, so, so uh, we've learned that machine learning often can beat uh, human uh, hand engineering. Um, but, but particularly in that sort of signal to symbol transition area where, where we just, uh, we, we, we had no shortage of data and we had, and, and we, but we had this huge gap to cross. Uh, so I think we will see a lot more hybridization of the techniques and I expect the higher level systems will look a lot more like probabilistic programming and, and even logical or relational type representations. But, but, but anything dealing with signal data we now have this really powerful tool. And uh, who knows, um, uh, you know, we can do end-to-end -end training of these systems now if we can make all of the components differentiable. And, uh, you know, several people are using this phrase differentiable programming to sort of describe what's going on, that these are not unformed neural networks. People really think very carefully about, they're really designing a, a skeletal program which is right. then filled in with data. Right, and a pipeline that w yeah. that where you could actually literally have a surface to optimize over. Well, and we have memory units, and we have uh, time series units. I mean, all kinds of, again, uh, innate things are being programmed in, and uh, both in the probabilistic frameworks and and in the and in these deep learning frameworks, we have much more expressive languages and ways of training and reasoning over them. And 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 you know, these huge advances in in Hamiltonian or in Ma Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Oh, this is just so cool. So. So, so Tom, you and I were were, were involved in the 2008-2009 Triple um, AI um, panel on long-term AI futures, and I think you actually right. you actually uh, co-chaired um, one of the subcommittees. Uh, I think it was on short-term disruptions, um, and 
back when we had the meeting at a cinemar, we had Andrew Ng get up, and I asked him, I gave him a challenge, and I said, to kick off this whole day at a cinemar, uh with this group thinking about long-term AI uh, futures, tell us what's going to surprise us. And he gave up and gave a, essentially, if you look back upon his talk, he gave a deep learning talk, and that was in February of 2009. Right. Uh, and that summer we had the, the kind of, like, the first breakthrough, I think, at Microsoft Research with, with speech. Hmm. So if I ask you that again, now, now that we've been through a few surprises uh, with the power of DeepNet to do object recognition and so on, and I ask you this question now, what might surprise us, Tom, uh, in the next five to 10 years, what comes to mind? Well, one of the other things that we talked about that, that I, in, in my group there at Asilomar was AI-enabled crime. <laughs> and, uh, and we've just seen a very interesting report come out uh, across several organizations uh, uh, about potential misuses of, of the current AI technology. Um, you know, and it's clear there, there are risks in cybersecurity. Uh, we now have the ability to create extremely high quality fake video in which you and I could be saying absolutely outrageous, terrible things, um, and we, and which is sort of the automated fake news problem. So that, those, I'm afraid we might have some very bad surprises along those lines because, uh, first of all, we as people are, are kind of suckers for the interesting story and the conspiracy theory, uh, and we've seen that uh, at, at play in social media. Um, but also, our institutions are not adapting as quickly as our algorithms are. Um, at the same time, I guess a reason for hope there is that we are aware of this, and, and many people are scrambling pr uh, to think about all of these ethical and social consequences of our, of our systems. And uh, the, the, the industry, even more maybe than the universities, is deeply engaged in this. And, and of course, your leadership of the Partnership for AI, uh, I think, is going to be a key part of of, uh, of, of preparing us for, to move forward on that. How about technically, though, surprises? I mean, what might, what might be a, the ups, an upside in the technical breakthrough? Well, I would like to say mm -hmm. that we would have some beautiful breakthroughs in, say, uh, dialogue systems, uh, that we could really have more than a one-step interaction with, with Cortana. Uh, and, uh, and I think we'll see some uh, progress there, but again, it's going to have to be narrow because uh, you know, at computer vision people like to say that anything can appear in an image, and natural language people can say anything, you can talk about anything in speech. In fact, unlike in images, you can talk about abstract things, ideas and trends and paradigms, and, and, uh, and our computer systems don't have any idea what those are, and, and, it will be, and we don't know how to program those uh, ourselves. And it's hard to figure out how we're going to get the training data for that either. We can't ground those the way we can with with ImageNet or, or giant uh, corpora. So, um, so I guess I am not so optimistic that we'll, but, but, but I do think that we can have much better conversations than we have now. Um, another area that I think is going to be a huge uh, opportunity is to couple deep learning with uh, all these problems in medicine, right? Everything in medical imaging is in the middle of being totally revolutionized because these tools for deep learning that we've been using for you know, entertainment on the web are now uh, being transferred to, to uh, understanding all of these complex images in medicine. Uh, so that's really exciting, I think. Do you yeah. see implications for the, the nature of work and human jobs and versus what the machines do and so on? What's your, what's, what are you think, what's your thinking about that? Well, certainly there, there are some uh, work, including, let's say, the, you know, my, my physician friends who describe their work as intellectual assembly line work. Uh, there are some aspects of many knowledge worker type jobs that, that we'll be able to, um, I won't say automate necessarily, but provide very good assistance. Um, but, uh, but I don't think that we're going to see entire jobs go away. It's, I think uh, jobs are going to be redefined um, uh, so that uh, some of, the, some of the, uh, what was currently in a job description will now be something we can uh, do very effectively with an AI tool. Uh, and, and then other, that, everything will rearrange as a result. Uh, and, and uh, so I think virtually every job category will probably be affected by some of these things, just as the internet and the web, say, transform travel agents or uh, 
many other things. Um, uh, and yet, uh, I, I, you know, I think there are so many things where, where anything that requires breadth, we know our computer systems are going to continue to be narrow for a long time. And so I think any job that requires breadth and integration of information, uh, dealing with humans and all of the uh, human things, uh, I, uh, I think is, is are, are areas that are, are going to be critical. Um, you know, Stuart Russell used to, to make this point in, in response to the skeptics about AI who would say, well, you're just making simulations. He would say, well, when a computer simulates playing chess, it's actually playing chess. And we have now it plays Go as well. Um, but I think it's always going to be true that when a computer simulates having emotions, it is just simulating having emotions. Because not being human, it can't have any direct experience of human emotion. So it's always just going to be struggling as an alien would struggle to understand us. And so I think all of the, all of the job functions that involve negotiation and understanding people and human experience are going to be very firmly in the in the place where humans will be doing them. Yeah, I like to, I, 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 the way I like to think about this, uh, and I, I, I resonate deeply, is that with the rise of automation around us, that there'll be even uh, uh, an amplification and uh, a uh, celebration of of human touch, human caring, maybe even the rise of a caring economy of, mm -hmm. of, of, yeah. of human human experience. So. Um, you mentioned earlier about you like to get into applications, not just theory, be in the open world, um, both technically as well as making contributions there. And you've done incredible work in this um, this rising area that you helped, helped to define, uh, we call computational sustainability now. Mm -hmm. And talk more about how you got involved with the whole, the, the whole biological world and the environment and applications there. I think it's such an exciting and important space. Yes, well, I guess I would I like to say it was a mid-career crisis because, uh, you know, after I got my PhD and I got tenure and so on, um, uh, you know, and I was publishing lots of nice technical papers, but I didn't feel like I was having enough impact in terms of problems that really mattered. And one of those is, is the environment and the threats from climate change. Uh, and so uh, being at Oregon State University, it turns out, uh, it, there's always a toss-up between Oregon State and Yale and Cornell as to who's number one in, in ecology. But uh, I, I missed we, I missed out on that 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 uh, okay. that competition. But um, yes. I believe it. It turns out, like in forestry <laughs> schools, ag schools. <laughs> yes, uh, right. So um, uh, and so uh, there there were tremendous uh, uh, wonderful collaborators to work with at Oregon State, and so I got involved uh, gradually with several projects. Uh, and we started a training program, a PhD training program, in what we were calling at the time ecosystem informatics, although informatics maybe wasn't quite the right word because it was more uh, simultaneously trying to support ecologists, ecological scientists who are trying to understand how ecosystems function, but also policymakers and uh, like the EPA or the Forest Service or uh, farmers and so on who are actually managing an ecosystem trying to make it work. Uh, and, and so uh, building tools, helping, giving them, really taking the modeling tools that we have from, say, sequential decision making and, and uh, decision analysis and, and, and making it possible for them to apply them to these challenging problems. And so uh, we also have like a summer training program and then we got these large grants from the National Science Foundation. Uh, and so then, and then one thing leads to another. So I, on the supporting ecological science side, I got heavily involved collaborating with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, and, and this brings us to another one of your favorite topics, which is crowdsourcing. <laughs> so, you know, there are many passionate bird watchers in the world, and Cornell was one of the first organizations to try to engage them in massive data collection efforts through something they call eBird, where bird watchers can go out, uh, you know, go for a two hour hike maybe, and uh, create a checklist of all the birds they saw along that hike, and then they can upload that to a website. Um, and, uh, and we promised we were gonna do science with that data, but then it turned out to be tricky to do science with that data, and so uh, I was one of many people uh, working then on how to take that data that was being collected and figure out could we fit could we understand bird habitat requirements? Could we understand bird migration, uh, which happens at continental scales with billions of birds? 
And so we've made some progress on those, on those questions, it, and it's been a load of fun. And then on the policy side, uh, I was looking at problems, say, in uh, wildfire management in the West or in invasive species management. And there you have you know, tight budgets, and you have to carefully choose what actions to perform. And you also have some serious risks, you know, uh, massive fires or species extinctions or agricultural challenges. So lots of interesting problems to work on. So now that you have uh, comma emeritus after your name, mm -hmm. you might be in a position to give advice to folks who are just starting out in their careers about what to look out for, what to think about, what to reflect about, how to make decisions about a career in computer science. So I have some thoughts you want to share with, uh, with young computer scientists or people even thinking about computer science? Well, I think it's important to focus on the foundations, right? So, um, and that doesn't mean just taking like the foundational classes in computer science, but more, um, there's a temptation, I think, and it's gotten very exaggerated lately in machine learning, uh, that we jump immediately to coding up an experiment and running it. Uh, and I think it's important to first consider what are, what are the sort of scientific hypotheses that you're testing. Uh, too much of, of experimental computer science has turned into demos rather than into really asking uh, what are the questions uh, that, that we really need to un answer in order to move uh, our, our understanding of computing forward and then what experiments can I do to answer those questions, really taking a scientific approach to things um, uh, rather than just trying to grab for the low-hanging fruit of whatever current uh, a, a paradigm is popular. And it's tough because uh, the reviewers at conferences uh, may be looking for you know, what's hot right now, and maybe they haven't thought about some of those other things for a while. Um, but, I, but I think you need a rudder that's heading you toward uh, you know, success in the long term, and, uh, uh, and, and I think, and also part of that, I think, is keeping yourself honest by working on real problems. Uh, and so, nowadays, the secret is collaboration, right? You really need, it, particularly if you want to dive deep into a domain, you're, you can't simultaneously be an expert in the domain and an expert in computer science, although you tried with an MD and a PhD. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you really need to find a collaborator who uh, can also do that deep dive with you. And um, they need to be willing to also learn some computer science. So that, and you have to budget a year or two just to, to learn the vocabulary of each other's fields and understand also the, I say, social standards and more as what, what uh, counts as a research result and uh, how can you both succeed. Uh, but the payoff then is um, that you can not only discover new and important computer science questions, but you can have an impact in, in those fields as well. You've been a fabulous advisor to so many students. Your webpage has a big list of all the successful students that have, gotten, that have done PhDs with you. Any advice for getting through a dissertation and the whole process? This is more practical on the practical right, side. Right, yes. Um, well, I, uh, I th first of all, it's certainly, it's normal to feel despair at various points <laughs> in the PhD. Uh, and uh, to feel that, all, I remember when I was stuck in my third year, which seemed to take two or three years, uh, of trying to decide, well, what would my thesis be about? Um, I think I met you around those years. Yes, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I went through seven different <laughs> topics or something. Um, everything either seemed impossible or too easy. Uh, and the lesson I learned was that the too easy problems were also hard. <laughs> so, so, um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's good to, do, I mean, Donald Knuth has this advice, right? He says, you know, first solve a problem that will take you a minute, and then maybe one that will take you an hour, and then the one that will take you a day, and then one that you think will take you a month, and then one that ends up taking you a year, and then you graduate. So, uh, so I think uh, the, I, I, I've taught research methods, and, I, and, and, you know, there's all these methods about, well, how to do a statistical test correctly. But I think the number one question of research methodology is, what do I do this today when I come into my office and sit down that is going to move me forward on this project? And as long as you do something every day that does that, you'll move forward. And you uh, probably so won't feel so, so despair. Well, yes, but <laughs> you, you just have to pace yourself and realize that, it, yes, it, progress happens in small increments. And, uh, and you should have a backup plan because everything, many things will fail along the way. So you need a fallback strategy. You shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, thanks, Tom. It's been great talking to you. I've it's been it. a great pleasure. Thank you.